Welcome back to our next section in soil fertility. Uh, last time we were talking about an overall turf grass system to manage growth by limiting one nutrient. Here's an example. This is Brora in Scotland where they've not applied any nitrogen fertilizer for five or six years. Um, they have a grass that's tight. Uh, it's a little bit lighter in color. It could, could be considered chlorotic. Chlorotic is going to be one of our vocabulary words we talk about. But it's an excellent putting surface. Um, as we look here, um, and you hit that, hit that with your putter, and it almost sounds like wood. So you get big bounces. It's a very hard surface. It's a throwback to the old link-style golf courses. And this is probably one thing that the industry will be going to in the future. So you need to understand nitrogen and nitrogen management to understand that well. Two major functions of nitrogen. One, it's a integral part of the chlorophyll molecule. And two, it makes up all the amino acids that the plant needs to make proteins, enzymes, and vitamins. So we could really call nitrogen a building block of the plant. And here's our chlorophyll molecule. And as you can see from this diagram, the chlorophyll molecule is centered by a magnesium molecule surrounded by one, two, three, four nitrogens. The rest, all of these branches, are carbon change, chains. A little bit of oxygen there. But this molecule is the basis for building all carbon chains. It starts from a hemoglobin molecule. Actually, when the plant makes it, it has an iron, an Fe in the middle. It creates this molecule, a hemoglobin molecule, and then it pulls the iron out and puts the magnesium in there, which allows it to function in photosynthesis. But it's a very similar molecule to a molecule found in humans, hemoglobin that carries oxygen through the blood. All you weightlifters out there are going to recognize this slide. Uh, lysine, proline, all of these amino acids contain nitrogen. Let's bring in our bouncing amino acids. So there's many, many amino acids. They're the building blocks of protein. All that meat that you eat all has nitrogen in it. Um, not in as big a component as carbon, as you see from all these rings, but definitely an important part of the function of life. So, when we look at nitrogen in the soil, um, it's very difficult to measure. It moves quickly, and your soil test is not going to have nitrogen measurements on it. Um, ammonium is a cation. It doesn't bind. Oh, it, excuse me. Ammonium is a cation. It can be measured in parts per million, but it's expensive. Nitrate is an anion, negatively charged. Uh, nitrate is NO3 minus, which means it can move through the soil very quickly. We talk about nitrate leaching. Ammonia is NH4. N H four plus. So it is a cation, but it's readily moved around to different forms, and we generally have decided it doesn't help to measure it in the soil. It does help to measure it in the plant. So plant tissue analysis is going to be the best way. And uh, our slide from the last section will say there's oftentimes we can see 6% nitrogen in some of those tissue samples. So by applying nitrogen, by getting out there with the fertilizer spreader, which most all of you have done, we're going to see vegetative growth. We're going to see green color um, because we're going to build proteins. We're going to build chlorophyll. This chlorophyll builds green color. It makes helps the plant photosynthesize and increases growth. So um, these are all good things, but in most things in turf grass, if a little bit's good, doesn't mean that a lot more is better. 
if we're going to measure uh, nitrogen in the soil, up to 99% of the nitrogen in the soil is immobilized. It's in organic matter. It's not available to the plant. So this 1% in the system that's ammonia, your NH4+, plus, or nitrate, which is NO3-, minus, is available to the plant, but that's a very small percentage of the total nitrogen that's in the system in the soil, and even a smaller percentage of the total nitrogen that's in the air and the soil. One thing that comes up, um, and we'll talk about it when we talk about the whole nitrogen system, is volatilization. Volatilization is when we have ammonia um, combined with hydroxyls, OH minus, um, and oftentimes in a high pH environment, a base, not an acid, we can get some formation of ammonia gas, NH3. And hydrogen gas. So sometimes if you put urea on the surface and it's left there in a not watered in on an area that has a lime or a high pH, you can get some volatilization. There's not a lot of that in the turfgrass system. It is something that people worry about. You don't want to waste money through volatilization. It's probably less of a problem than nitrate leaching into the water. That's something that people are really worried about and shown in the most turf grass system studies that there's not, if any, uh, nitrate leaching, but be aware that volatilization is something that can happen. And I put a website there. Um, University of Missouri has a nice website that explains volatilization, but pretty much urea or these simple nitrogens can get into the, the air if you're not careful and you don't water in your fertilizers. So. Let's start uh, the nitrogen cycle. Let's start with a little bit of organic nitrogen. We've got our donkey, and he's applying some organic nitrogen. Um, that will be not available to the plant in that form. So a lot of the fertilizers we put on are not available. We need microorganisms to mineralize that organic nitrogen. They will decompose. They will use the carbon in those amino acids and as they do that, they will leave the mineral nitrogen in the soil available for other organisms to use, usually in the form of ammonia, sometimes in the form of nitrate or nitrite. So uh, ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite, they're bacteria in the soil that move um, the form of nitrogen very quickly. You will notice that ammonia can be taken up by the plant, by a turf grass plant or by any plant, and also nitrates, the NO3 minus, can be taken up by plants. The nitrite is not often taken up by plants because it goes quickly uh, from ammonia. We could almost leave this step out for the sake of this graph. When it's taken up by the plant, it's immobilized. It can also be mo immobilized by volatilization, but again, that's only if we have urea on the surface. So we really, this is this is not happening very much that volatilization. But the mobilization is happening, and as it's immobilized, it's put back in a organic form. So you need to know what mineralization is. You need to know what immobilization is. Denitrification, that volatilization, nitrogen being taken out of the system probably don't want that. Um, there's a lot of nitrogen in the air. That's our N2 gas. Um, there's a couple ways it can be taken out of the air. Uh, note that's an expensive process. All of our fertilizer plants use quite a bit of energy in the form of natural gas to pull that nitrogen out of the air into the form of urea or some other fertilizers, which we're going to talk about later. But nature has a way of pulling nitrogen out of the air, too, and it's through a symbiotic relationship um, with a bacteria. Uh, rhizobia bacteria uh, will live in the roots, knots, little knot nodules on the roots of legumes. And the most important legume in the turf grass system is clover. But other important legumes in the farming system, soybeans is a legume, 
That's why farmers grow a lot of soybeans because they don't need to add as much nitrogen to the system. Um, Redbud, Circus canadensis, um, is also a nitrogen fixing plant. So in your landscape, you can use that. In fact, most plants with pods are legumes and can form. They don't necessarily have to form, but they can form a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. Uh, the plants give the bacteria sugar through photosynthesis. That's quite expensive, sharing their resources, but in return they get nitrogen, which allows them to build faster, quicker solar panels to improve the speed and efficiency of that photosynthesis equation in the plant. This slide's just a check. Um, how does man affect the nitrogen cycle? Um, in native forests, usually it comes to a balance. When man comes in and begins to farm, is the nitrogen, total nitrogen in the soil going to go up or is it going to go down? You need to think about that and come up with an answer and run it by me and I'll let you know if you're right. Also, in the turf grass system, is managing turf the way we manage turf today at the golf course where you work going to increase nitrogen in the total system or decrease it? And also, probably a better way is in your pots. So you're at work on your mini putting greens. Tell me what happens to the nitrogen in that system. If you don't understand it, please send me an email or ask me when we have class and I will help you understand the system of nitrogen in the soil. So as with most things in the turf grass system, if a little bit is good, a lot does not make it better, although some people think it does. When we add nitrogen, um, we're going to get softer, weaker plants. One of the terms for that is succulents. That's a good vocabulary word. It's going to be prone to disease. Um, it will mature more slowly. It will harden off more slowly, so you'll have more damage, damage more winter kill. If you have Bermuda grass, it's very green and succulent going into the cool. October months and um, for you gardeners out there it, the flavor can be inhibited and nitrate can build up so we want to be careful not to over fertilize and, and the trend is probably to pull back and that's what they've done at Brora and in a, in a lot of places to limit the growth and in, in, uh, in yield and turf grass is a double-edged sword we want the plants to be growing but we don't want to have to be mowing them all the time okay now let's check I want you to do this math problem, and we'll go over it in class. If you have problems, and ask me, or I'll put up a video of how to do it. But this is probably the most important math problem a turf manager needs to do. Whenever you put out fertilizer, you want to calculate how much you actually put out. You want to count the bags. You know how much weight you put out. You know how much area you put out. What was your rate? You need to adjust for next time. You need to know what you did. So if you have 100 grams of, of urea in a spreader, 3 feet wide, and walk 20 feet, and then you weigh it again, and there's 873 grams left, so, so um, how much nitrogen was put out per 1,000 square feet? There's four simple parts to this problem. You need to do each part alone, slowly, one at a time, keeping track of the units. I guarantee you, if you do not put down your units when you do math, it's, it's wrong. Um, so how much product was applied to the area above? A simple subtraction will give you that. Then we're going to reduce it down, um, do a little bit of uh, division to get the ratio. And I'm sure you've gone over that with David in your math class. And then uh, nitrogen applied to the area per thousand square feet. So you shrink it down, blow it up and then get it to the right units. And anytime you want to get something to the right units, you can multiply anything by one. So uh, any equal units you can put over the top of each other and cancel out. For example, 12 inches equals one foot. So 12 inches over one foot equals one. Equal 12 inches over one foot equals 12 inches over 12 inches. 12 inches divided by 12 inches is one. So that cancels out the units. So multiplying by one is one of the integral parts of this curriculum. And you should be able to do that by now. That should be old hat and review. So what what's going on here? Um, this area has no nitrogen, zero pounds per thousand square feet. 
This area has one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. This area here has ten pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And you can see a little bit's good. Excess is not. We can kill the grass. We can get into that toxic range with a 10x application of nitrogen. And it actually burns the plant. The nitrogen is a salt, and it sucks the moisture out of the plant. So this area will come back and grow very heavily. But this is what I like to call the mortal sin of fertilization. If you have people out there that are killing grass with fertilizer, you're, you're, you're making a huge mistake. And one of the worst ways that I've seen this is uh, there are some spreaders that have a, a rotating wand in the back. And uh, if you shut that wand off before you shut the bin off that puts the nitrogen in, the next time you turn it on, the, the wand will be full of nitrogen. And it'll throw out a big amount of fertilizer. So one of the rules when I was running a crew um, is if you're out on that spreader, the the wand has to always be moving. You turn the fertilizer on and off, but you never turn the wand off or else you're going to get these big throws of burnt area of nitrogen, and that's just, just not acceptable. So, um, Don't commit the mortal, mortal sin. Don't let your employees commit uh, the mortal sin of killing grass with nitrogen. When you apply nitrogen, um, it shifts the growth from the roots to the leaves. This is a very important concept, probably one of the most important concepts. And it makes a lot of sense. If the plant has adequate nitrogen, nitrogen is brought in from the soil. It's usually the limiting nutrient. Um, it pretty much signals to the plant that we have adequate roots. It's now time to make sugar. Sugar can help us grow more roots. Sugar can help us get through the winter. So we're using sugar to build roots. Once we find that nitrogen, we're going to put out the solar panels. We're going to make leaves. We're going to make top growth. And we're going to make sugar. Um, if that system, if that switches, if we run out of nitrogen, if, if we stop, we're not able to make chlorophyll, then the plant will shift its carbohydrates reserves to, to roots. So nitrogen is a good management of roots. And sometimes when we have low roots in the system, it's because we've been fertilizing too much. I apologize, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's really summing up the balance of nitrogen. Um, we don't want to have deficient nitrogen. If we have deficient nitrogen, we'll get diseases, uh, the slow growth diseases like dollar spot and red thread. If we over fertilizer, we'll bring on the succulent. Um, there's your vocabulary word, succulent. Um, diseases like pythium and brown patch, which we're going to talk about quite extensively in your classes this summer and then again next fall. So it's a balance. You're balancing color, yield, and overall appearance of the turf. So um, by metering out that nitrogen, you can manage the diseases you're going to get. We really want to stay away from pythium. That's one of the worst turf diseases. Uh, brown patch is something we can control, but we don't want to. Dollar spot and red thread are easier to control. We see signs of those we can fertilize, and the plant can readily grow out of those uh, less destructive diseases than the pythium and the brown patch. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about fertilizer programs for your warm season versus your cool season grasses. Um, cool seasons and grasses are going to be predisposed to grow in the spring. So we don't want to overload them with N when they're going to grow anyway. We want to keep them from getting yellow, so smaller amounts of nitrogen. Um, but then a little bit of increased nitrogen in the fall has been a practice that works. It's a little bit controversial. I want you to think about why it would be controversial. But um, it's proven to, to work, and it's proven to not even be as big a problem as some people originally thought. Um, this late fall fertilization, um, after the shoot growth has stopped, there's some evidence that shows the roots are still growing. They can still take up nitrogen. So the plant's not going to get that growth. You're not going to have trouble hardening off, but you'll get a much earlier green up. You can't get out there in the spring to fertilize it. You don't want to, but we can get it once this nitrogen gets into the system. Um, bacteria will get going in the spring, and it will be naturally released. Um, any problems. And one of the problems that was thought of this is this is the one time when turf 
could be putting nitrogen into the, the groundwater, into, into bad places that we don't want. So you want to be careful with it. You don't want to be putting excessive amounts of nitrogen out, particularly right before big rainfalls or events when it's going to get washed into the ponds. But research shows done properly, this is an effective technique that doesn't harm the environment as much as one would think. So here's a nitrogen program for cool season grasses. I'm not going to go over it extensively, but about four pounds of nitrogen total. Small amounts, March, April, May, June. Uh, July and August, you're just getting it by. Uh, June, July, excuse me, and then August, you can start fertilizing with normal growth. And then a little bit of extra nitrogen for the late fall. Um, is a typical bent grass fertility program uh, here in North Carolina. So we can see um, we've got growth rate here on the y-axis and month on the x-axis. We can see our cool season grasses are going to have that big propensity to grow. And then July and August, not so much growth. So we're just managing uh, plants in a difficult system and then a little bit of fall growth. Our Bermuda grass is going to be just the opposite, a, a pretty curve that tracks temperature very closely. And um, that makes fertility a little bit easier for the, the warm season grasses. Um, in fact, the standard rule is one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per growing month on warm season turf grasses. And that, that's probably a good recommendation. People can go a little bit more in growing when you're really trying to grow it, but pulling back to that seems to give adequate color growth um, without excessive um, succulent turf. Um, soil type weather um, is going to change. If you have a sandy soil and it rains, obviously, uh, if you have a water-soluble end source, you might have to put something else down, but you also want to think about where that's going. So um, some care and fertility is always recommended. Here's a picture of our dormant Bermuda grass. So obviously, we would not want to be applying nitrogen to this area um, in the dormant months, November, December, January. But overseeded areas create a unique problem. So here's a T at Eagle Point. Um, you see the Bermuda grass is uh, not a bad surface. It's a different type of color, but uh, nice to play on once you get past the idea that playing on uh, golden brown turf is, is acceptable. Um, but the T area creates some unique problems. Okay, overseeding is a huge debatable issue here. Some courses, like Augusta and Forest Creek, for all intents and purposes, are ryegrass courses. These golf courses, the Bermuda grass is only there to hold the soil in June, July, and August. There's not a lot of play at this time. That's not when they get the big bucks. So ryegrass is an integral part of the turf system. Other golf courses, like Country Club in North Carolina, don't even overseed. So different philosophies. Paul Jett's in between. So he'll put ryegrass out, but his primary goal oftentimes is the survival of the Bermuda grass. Um, generally, a half to a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per growing month will help avoid uh, yellow color. Um, you can manage the ryegrass to be finer and smaller with less nitrogen. Um, generally, turf managers will raise the height of cut in the fall to try to get some carbohydrate storage into the Bermuda grass. Um, but if we scalp it for the ryegrass to get a good catch of the ryegrass, that, that could damage and will damage the Bermuda grass. In the spring, we want to shift back what we call transition. There are chemicals that can do that. Curb is, is one that's often used. We can also use some maintenance practices, particularly lowering the height of cut. Um, to increase the light that gets to the warm season grass, to allow the warm season grass to grow up through the cool season ryegrass uh, that's overseeded. So this is an issue we'll discuss quite a bit. A lot of different opinions. I'm not going to say one's right or one's wrong. It depends on your membership and what they want you to do. Okay, the last little grouping of slides in this section, we're going to talk about uh, different types of fertilizer and break them down. We've got water-soluble nitrogen. We've got water-insoluble nitrogen. Uh, Water-soluble nitrogen is going to be released much more quickly. The urea that we talked about and many of the inorganics are going to provide a quicker turf response. 
the caref can burn more easily with these. Um, there's more leaching potential, and they're cheaper. Water insoluble um, are going to be the natural organics and the synthetic organics, and the, they're going to have a more extended, a more metered response. Um, where these waters are going to have a growth spike that tails off, these will get a increased growth um, for a longer period of time that falls off, um, and less burn potential from the water insoluble nitrogen sources. So, what's the difference between an organic and an inorganic? Simply put, the organics have carbon. They are going to require some microbial activity to release the nitrogen, some mineralization, and that's an important word. You need to understand what mineralization means. Natural organics originate from plants and animals. Um, fish slurry extract, uh, chicken manure, all of those things are natural organics, long proven uh, guano. Uh, Donald Ross talked about driving the truck and Dornock up to the caves to get the bat guano to fertilize the greens. Um, there are also some synthetic organics um, that are man-made uh, carbon products that will act similarly to the natural organics. The inorganics, this is your fertilizer plant stuff. This is where we use natural gas to pull nitrogen out of the air. It comes out in the form sometimes of ammonium nitrate, um, which is very nitrogen intense, very high uh, rates of nitrogen and can cause burn. Ammonium sulfate, um, so if you need to acidify your soil, you would use ammonium sulfate because the sulfur, it's, you can think of it as becoming sulfuric acid and releasing hydrogen cations into the soil, which will drive pH down. If we need calcium, calcium nitrate is a, a way to add calcium to the system. That's never a bad idea. Calcium is a pretty important nutrient in the turf system. If we need potassium, we can use potassium nitrate. So different products, all made from energy, from fossil fuels, pulled out of the air. Um, less expensive than some of the organics. Um, sometimes uh, they have problems with water. Uh, hygroscopic is another good vocabulary word. When something's hygroscopic, it pulls water in and changes it. So if anybody's seen a, a bag of ammonium nitrate left it open, they know the water from the humidity in North Carolina or, or wherever is going to get in there and make that bag that hard and change the structure of that. So these fertilizer products need to go on dry, and then watering them in uh, will break them down and get them into the soil fairly quickly and make them available to the plant. Okay, some of our natural organic fertilizers, malorganite, probably the most common. Uh, sewer sludge from Milwaukee. Uh, beer production has created a unique product. Uh, it's only 2% nitrogen. Very widely accepted in the industry. Um, it's nice because it's about the size of bentgrass seed, so it's oftentimes used as a carrier for bentgrass seed. It's a dark black color. Uh, some superintendents believe that by putting that on their greens in the winter, they get earlier green up. Um, so that's been a successful product. Um, the Sustain is an animal manure, poultry manure product. So it's always good to be able to use waste products um, in the turf grass system. Um, and Renaissance is a newer plant product made from soybean protein. Um, it's a little bit more expensive and probably not as um, effective for the environment because uh, why not just till that stuff back into the soil and put the, the nitrogen that was fixed by the Rhizobia bacteria back into the field uh, where the farmer is. We have to transport it to the golf system. But that is an option and it is a natural organic um, interesting way to um, provide nitrogen in the system. And, and nitrogen is nitrogen, but there are many different ways to get it into the system. So our synthetic organic, urea is a synthetic organic. We can see 4600. It's not as hot as uh, ammonium nitrate. Uh, white crystals, um, cheap, um, doesn't burn as much as the, the, uh, the, excuse me, the ammonium nitrate. 
the simple product, but it's uh, it is water soluble and it's easily tank mixed and it's inexpensive. So this is what I use to fertilize my lawn, and uh, many superintendents use this uh, with their fungicide applications in small rates to spoon feed their turf through the the hot summer months. Some of the slower release synthetic organics, uh, urea formaldehyde, um, methylated urea, IBDUs, isobutadiene diurea um, requires uh, no microbial activity. Urea formaldehyde and methylia, methylated ureas do require microbial activity. So uh, anything that requires microbial activity will be temperature dependent. Some of the encapsulated we're going to talk about quite a bit here. Sulfur coated urea, that's the urea molecule from the last slide uh, covered with sulfur. And, uh, and it's going to be water released and then a polymer coated polymers would be plastic um, is a very controlled release so you can get you can really stretch out your fertilizer applications by using a more expensive polymer coated urea so if in areas where you're only going to be able to fertilize once a year uh, in your deep roughs probably maybe spending more for your nitrogen source is better where on your putting greens where you're going to be out on them every couple of weeks or every month you probably don't need to spend on uh, one of these slower release products. Sulfur coated urea works by moisture. So once we get a little bit of water there on the surface to the plant, the water will go through the sulfur coat. Um, once it penetrates that coat, it'll move around. Once it hits the urea, the urea will expand and we'll get and we get a catastrophic release of nitrogen. So no re re nitrogen comes out until the explosion and then the nitrogen all releases. So catastrophic release of nitrogen. With that catastrophic release you might ask, then why doesn't it act just like urea just a little bit later? And it does, but because the manufacturing process of urea is not perfect, we get different size layers of sulfur. Thick one here, uh, some of these are broken so water is going to get in here right away. This will release right away. Uh, maybe this one will release next. Maybe this one a day after that. So we get a slower release of nitrogen because of the inconsistencies of the sulfur coat and also uh, breaking in the bag. So a useful tool for turf managers to not get a big flush of growth and to spread that out and again the polymer is more uniform and the polymer releases the, the urea slowly so that's an even more expensive but more controlled system. So that's it for nitrogen you should have some tools now to pick the best product to put in your spreader and also know what it's going to do and also know sometimes you don't even need uh, to get out there uh, to properly manage your system.